Well, hello and welcome back to our Bible study coming to you on behalf of the Campbellsville Baptist Church here at 420 North Central Avenue in Campbellsville, Kentucky. My name is Dr. Terry Wilder and I teach at uh, Campbellsville University. I teach New Testament and Greek there. And my pastor, Dr. Dwayne Norman, and I would like to invite you uh, to, uh, to visit us at Campbellsville Baptist Church. We would love to have you come for morning worship, which starts at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Just prior to morning worship at 9.15 a.m., we have Sunday School Connect Groups. And we would love to have you visit. We'd like to get to know you and to uh, answer any questions you might have and help you with your walk in the Lord and encourage you in any walk of life uh, that you're finding challenging now. Uh, and just to become you know, new friends, good friends with you. Uh, so that's an open invitation. We'd love to see you uh, visit our church. Well, we have been in the Johannine letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we have finished 1st John, and we have finished 2nd John. So now we want to look at 3rd John. Remember, 1st John, its overarching theme was assurance of salvation. And we looked at uh, the various uh, criteria uh, that uh, John uh, emphasized that if you measure up to these criteria, you can be assured that you know Christ. In 2nd John, we looked at uh, this, uh, this letter. It's a very short letter, just one chapter. Uh, and it's been neglected over the years. But the... Uh, the, um, the overarching theme there was do not support false teachers. Do not support false teachers. And today as we look at 3 John, it's just the opposite of 2 John. 3 John, its overarching theme is support uh, traveling preachers. In other words, show hospitality to traveling preachers and teachers. So let's, uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these letters that have been very encouraging and challenging and even convicting. Lord, we pray that uh, you would work in us through the implanted word that we hear and we see and read uh, here in, in, in the Bible. We pray that uh, the word would be rooted in us so that we might become more godly, more like Jesus, and so that we might become more effective uh, stewards of the gospel. Lord, work in us, we pray. Guide our study today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, uh, as is the usual approach, I'm going to go through again and uh, just rehearse. We've already highlighted this before, but uh, rehearse the, the traditional introductory information on author and date and so forth. Uh, the author of uh, Third John is the elder, the elder. Uh, so again, as I mentioned in Second John, uh, we think, uh, I think, and most scholars think that this is John the Apostle. There are some folks who believe that it's someone different than John the Apostle, John the Elder, but uh, I think it's John the Apostle, and so did the early church. So it's not uncommon for an apostle to call himself an elder. You might look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, where Peter, who is an apostle, Peter calls himself an elder. And the, the phrase, the term elder, certainly applies to John the Apostle because not only is he one who is mature and experienced in the Christian life, but he's also advanced in age. You know, we uh, think that uh, he was in his 90s at this point when, as he writes this letter. So John the Apostle uh, is the author. This letter, like uh, Second John and like First John, was probably written in Ephesus or in the vicinity of Ephesus. We know that uh, John at this point in time uh, is uh, there. He had been exiled on the Isle of Patmos, but he eventually returns to Ephesus after being released from uh, that island. I would date the uh, the letter of 3rd John the same as I did 2nd John, right around A.D. 90 to 95, so somewhere in the early to mid-90s, but I would date it later than 1st John, later than 1st John. And the recipients we see here in verse 1 of 3rd John 
is a fellow by the name of Gaius, the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, John says. So uh, Gaius here is probably, probably a convert of the Apostle John. There are other Gaiuses in Scripture, uh, but uh, none of them, uh, they're, they're primarily connected with Paul. Uh, but this Gaius is probably a convert, somebody that the Apostle John led to faith in Christ. We don't know where Gaius lived, that's unknown, but again, the location may be near Ephesus. And the purpose of this letter of 3 John is that Gaius is urged to continue his generous hospitality toward traveling uh, Christian preachers and teachers, despite the refusal, the refusal of a man by the name of De Diotrephes. Diotrephes refuses to support uh, these traveling Christians and uh, preachers and teachers who are connected, it, it appears in our text, with the Apostle John. Diotrephes is a controlling and autocratic leader who loves to be first. So that's the purpose. Gaius is urged to continue his generous hospitality towards traveling Christian preachers and teachers, itinerant preachers and teachers. So if you want to study an outline of 3 John, I would say in verses 1 through 4, you have your salutation. In verses 5 through 8, uh, John issues a commendation, a commendation, in other words, he commends him. He commends Gaius. In verses 9 and 10, John warns against Diotrephes. He issues a warning against Diotrephes. In verses 11 and 12, he commends a fellow by the name of Demetrius. So he issues a commendation, a commendation of Demetrius. And then in verses 13 through 15, we have our closing um, words from the Apostle John. So as we go through this letter, I hope that you'll find it encouraging. Uh, remember in that day, uh, you had uh, uh, preachers and teachers who traveled from place to place, largely. Uh, they were itinerant. Um, I suppose uh, one of the, um, the modern-day counterparts, although they're disappearing themselves, uh, used to have uh, itinerant evangelists, vocational evangelists, who would travel from place to place and do revivals uh, in churches. But uh, the overarching theme of Third John is show hospitality to traveling preachers and teachers, to itinerant preachers. And so let's uh, dig into our text. Well, in verses 1 through 4, we see here in Third John that the elder... Again, this is John the Apostle. The elder addresses his letter to Gaius. He describes Gaius as beloved in the truth. And John wishes him prosperity. And he rejoices to learn that he is living according to the truth. We see this in verses 1 through 4. Follow along with me, if you would, as I read. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects, in other words, in every way, that you may prosper and be in good health. So uh, not necessarily a, um, a, a wish for prosperity in the sense of financial um, prosperity, but uh, he says in all respects, he prays that he might prosper and be in good health. And uh, there's a comparison there, be in good health just as your soul prospers. So he wishes him to prosper just as he prospers spiritually, just as your soul prospers. And then he says this as he continues to explain in verse 3, For I was very glad when brethren came, in other words, other Christians, and testified to your truth. That is, in other words, that you're walking in truth, how you're walking in truth. So John rejoices the fact that uh, Gaius is living in such a way that he's walking in accordance with the truth. And John rejoices that others testify concerning uh, Gaius' walk with the Lord, 
that he's walking in the truth. And John says in verse 4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children, not biological child, but spiritual child. Remember, um, I said that he's probably someone that the Apostle John led to faith in Christ, and in that sense, he is John the Apostle's child in the faith. I have no greater joy than this, and here it is, to hear of my children walking in the truth. And if you've ever led anybody to Christ, it is a great joy to see and to hear how those people begin to grow in the faith and grow spiritually. There is a joy to that, not only in leading them to Christ, but seeing them grow in the Lord. So that's what John is expressing here in verses 1 through 4. In verses 5 through 8, Gaius is commended for his hospitality towards these traveling preachers of the gospel because they are God's workers, because they are God's workers. Notice in verses 5 through 8, follow with me if you would, uh, as I read, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. Verse 6, and they have testified your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. He continues to explain, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So here in verses 5 through 8, John will make a number of points. First of all, in verses 5 through 6, John commends Gaius for his faithful support of these traveling missionaries, these traveling preachers and teachers, and he exhorts him to continue to support them properly. He points out in verses 7 and 8 that Gaius should support these preachers because by helping them, he will become a fellow worker for the truth, since they are God's workers depending solely on believers for support. So these traveling preachers and teachers in that day, uh, John is encouraging them to support them because they have no means as they travel, really, uh, except the brethren, uh, except uh, Christians who will accommodate them and support them uh, as they engage in their, their ministries. So uh, a very encouraging letter along uh, those lines. You know, and when you participate... When you support somebody in a ministry, you really do help them uh, to continue in that ministry. I, I know no one likes to ask for money, but let's face it, it takes money uh, to, um, to, to do things, especially if you're, uh, you're in a faith-based type ministry where you rely on others for support. And when you participate, when you give to a particular um, ministry, you, in a sense, you in sense in a, engage in that ministry with them because you are um, helping them to continue in that ministry. Uh, a little warning there, you ought to be very careful about what uh, uh, ministry you support, and you should know, before you ever give to a ministry, you should know what that ministry is all about because you don't want to support something that is unbiblical or perhaps uh, something that you don't agree with. Uh, but, uh, but, those who are in faith-based ministries, and particularly those who are itinerant, they need, and missionaries, they need our support financially. They need to know that there are others who are um, who's supporting them. We are fellow workers with the truth when we do that with their ministries. Well, in verses 9 and 10, um, John will move on to this fellow by the name of Diotrephes. I've always thought his name makes a good trivia question if you're into Bible trivia and listening to, uh, you know, and, and playing those sorts of uh, games. But uh, Diotrephes, here in verses 9 and 10, is condemned by the uh, Apostle John for his autocratic rejection of these itinerant preachers and teachers and missionaries. He's condemned. Notice, listen to what he says. John writes, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. 
For this reason, if I come, John says, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does. And here's what he does. Unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so, in other words, to receive the brethren, who desire to do so, and he puts them out of the church. In other words, he excommunicates them. So, Diotrephes is condemned by the Apostle John in verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, because Diotrephes is domineering, he rejects John's request for hospitality from the church for these traveling preachers that are associated with John, verse 9. In verse 10, Diotrephes, we saw in verse, verse 10 that he has slandered the apostle and these preachers, these traveling preachers who are connected with the apostle John, uh, who are associated with John. He's refused aid to them and he's excommunicated everybody in the church assembly who desire to aid these itinerant ministers, these itinerant teachers and preachers. And John says, I don't know if you caught that or not in verse 10, I'm determined to deal with him if, you know, when John visits the church. So if John the apostle says, if I must visit the church, I'm determined to deal with Diotrephes when I come. Uh, that's uh, that's, uh, you know, John the Apostle, you know, sometimes we tend to think of him as not as bold and and um, uh, forth-telling as, say, the Apostle Paul. But uh, listen, th this, is a, uh, this, this man has backbone, John the Apostle does. He says, I will deal with him uh, if I have to come. So um, he's condemned by John the Apostle, this fellow by the name of Diotrephes. Gaius is commended. Diotrephes is condemned. Well, here in verses um, 11 and 12 of uh, 1 John, we also have another person who is commended, and this is a fellow by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius. <clears throat> Notice in verses 11 and 12, that Demetrius is commended to Gaius as a model of a well-reputed minister of the gospel in contrast to the evil example of Diotrephes, this one who loves to be first, here in verses 11 and 12. Follow along with me, if you would, as I read. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true, John writes. So what does John say here? Well, Gaius is urged to imitate that which is good and godly rather than um, the one who does evil, uh, rather than imitating evil. So he is told by the Apostle John to imitate uh, what is what is good and godly, not which is that which is evil and is ungodly. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. So here in mind, in verse 11, Demetrius is going to be the example of somebody who does what is good and godly. Diotrephes, whom he's already mentioned in verses nine and ten, is going to is is the example of somebody who um, who uh, who does what is evil and ungodly. Even though uh, Diotrephes is a apparently a church leader, he's one of these though that is you know it's my way or the highway, a type of thing, an autocratic uh, church leader who loves to be first. 
And um, boy, I'll tell you what, the, if a preacher has that attitude, uh, he really ought to find uh, some other line of work because that's not the example of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, as Mark 10, 45 uh, tells us. But here in verse 12, Demetrius is presented as a believer who is fully attested. In other words, people can attest to his character. He's presented as a believer who is fully attested. And John says, you know what? Demetrius is an example, Gaius, whom you can imitate. Notice verse 12 again. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. So he's got a really good reputation. Everyone talks about Demetrius and how he does what is good and what is godly. And not only from everyone, but the truth itself. The truth itself, the truth of the Word of God, testifies to Demetrius' character as well. And John says, you know what? We add our testimony. We add our testimony. I vouch for him too, John the Apostle says, and then he adds the, the assurance, and you know that our testimony is true. So this uh, letter really is a nice um, character study uh, as you study, well, not only the John the Apostle who writes the letter, but also uh, you've got uh, Gaius who's to be commended because he supports these traveling preachers. He uh, sends them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Um, he, uh, uh, he is uh, a fellow worker with the truth as he supports these various uh, um, traveling uh, preachers and teachers who are associated with the Apostle John. Uh, Diotrephes, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, like I say, an autocratic um, uh, leader, a dictator type who who refuses to support John. He slanders John. Uh, he does not support these teachers and preachers who are affiliated with John. He loves to be first. He kicks people out of the church who, uh, who desire to support these preachers and these teachers. I mean, it's a sad state of affairs when it comes to that with any church leader. And uh, I, I regret to say that I, I've known some over the years who, um, who, who are dictator-like in their various uh, uh, pastoral roles, and that, that should not be the case. You know, uh, pastors should be servants. Leaders should be servants, like the Lord Jesus was. Uh, yes, they, they lead churches, but they lead as servants, and they lead and they make decisions uh, along with uh, the congregation as they submit to the authority, the Lordship of Christ. The authority of Scripture is our authority. Scripture is our authority. And, uh, and we're all in this uh, pilgrimage uh, together and as we seek to follow the Lord. Yes, somebody has to lead, but that leader is not to be a dictator. So uh, John will wrap this letter up here in verses 13 and 14. Uh, notice what he says uh, in verses 13 and 14. So he's going to conclude with uh, greetings and a desire to speak to them personally about other things that he wants to say to them here in verses 13 and 14. Notice what he says. I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But in contrast to that, but I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. You know, so that's, uh, while, you know, letters are okay, I, and frankly, I don't know many people who write letters nowadays, to be honest. Uh, most people write emails or texts, you know, something of uh, that effect. But John says, you know, I've got more things I want to talk to you about, but I'm not willing to do them with, uh, you know, with an ink and with pen and ink. I'd rather see you face to face. And of course, we all would rather see somebody that we hold dear uh, and whom we support uh, face to face. It really does make a huge uh, difference. And so that's what John says as he concludes with greetings and he tells them he desires to speak with them personally about other things that he wants to say to them. Um, 
We don't know exactly what other things he might want to say to them, but knowing John, he would want to encourage them in their walk with Christ. He would want to encourage them to grow spiritually. We've already seen here in the early part of Third John that he rejoices that Gaius is, is that his soul is prospering. He rejoices that uh, Gaius is walking in accordance with God's truth. And then we see in verse uh, 15 uh, that he says, Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So peace be to you. This is a, a word, a, a rene. Uh, it's a, a, a Greek word from which we get the woman's name, Irene. I don't know a lot of people nowadays named Irene. I had an aunt who was named Irene. Uh, I didn't know, though, that her name came from a Greek word at the time, but I do now. And it simply means peace. So peace be to you. Um, peace is an inner sense of well-being that we have uh, because of our relationship with the Lord. You know, there can be chaos all around you with this kind of peace. And yet you've got peace, you've got calm, you've got this blessed assurance that, um, uh, you know, God's peace, the, the peace of the Lord, that uh, everything's going to be fine. You know, just as, um, you know, this, this calm assurance this inner sense of well-being because of our relationship with the Lord. So John, in, in closing, says, Peace be to you. Then he says this, The friends greet you. The friends greet you. That is interesting there. Um, who are these people, the friends? Uh, we, we don't know. I know we've got a denomination nowadays uh, known as the friends. Or these are Quakers. Um but uh, there are some who think that this refers to a special group of sorts, a special group uh, of perhaps co-workers uh, of, um, of, uh, of an apostle. Uh, the friends greet you. I know a, a friend of mine, and before he, while he was on the earth, um, and a mentor in many respects, Earl Ellis used to think that the friends was a, it was a different group that it was a uh, some sort of co-worker type group, some associates of some sort. But John, whoever they are, we don't know. John says, the friends greet you. They say hello. And then he says in verse 15, greet the friends by name. So uh, whenever they would come across the friends uh, or uh, you know some who may have been in this group or again, whoever he has in mind, he says, greet the friends by name. Call them by name. Greet them by name. So that closes our letter of Third John, and that will end our Bible study here of these wonderful letters of First, Second, and Third John. Again, our theme for this letter is show hospitality to uh, traveling preachers and teachers. It's just the opposite of Second John. Do not support false teachers. So uh, you know that's uh, this is a good word from both of these letters, Second and Third John, that um, that uh, we we tend to neglect, and uh, that we need to 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 hear and to do, being doers of the word and not hearers only. Well, I am so glad that you have joined us for these studies on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Again, my name is Dr. Terry Wilder, and I teach at Campbellsville University. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. I hope that you'll tune in to more uh, Bible studies that we have as we give an exposition of the uh, Word of God. And uh, I'm grateful for you, and thank you for, for tuning in. Again, I want to invite you to visit us at the Campbellsville Baptist Church at uh, any time. We would love to see you and meet you. Please tell us that uh, you saw us uh, online and uh, that you are interested in attending uh, our, uh, our church. Uh, so um, let's uh, close in prayer and ask that God would, um, would burn these words, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, into our hearts. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that it is quick and powerful than any sharp, 
sharp. Uh, it's quick and powerful. It's just like a sharp uh, two-edged sword, which cuts a pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Lord, we thank you for these words that we've seen John the Apostle teach, and we pray that we might incorporate them into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye now.